start. Thank you everyone for joining us for this, uh, for this webinar. It's probably my favorite so far. Uh, it's on uh, this issue of uh, quality job creation and how to engage investors around that. Uh, something that, um, as you know, at Transform Finance has been a focus for, uh, for quite a while now, uh, both uh, generally through our work with the investor network and specifically through the uh, job quality standards project that is now underway and that you'll, you'll hear more about um, throughout the course of the, of the webinar. Uh, I'll give a quick introduction uh, on this uh, and then we'll have a presentation from uh, Anair Benami of uh, Pi Investments and Tim Babnak and uh, Hope Mago from uh, Huntington Capital. Um, Pi and Huntington, as many of you know, have been uh, working together on uh, Huntington's current fund uh, to to deepen the uh, the impact and the quality of the of the jobs of the portfolio companies. Uh, Let's see. So, uh, why are we why are we talking about the job quality standards in this uh, in this context and in the context of the of the investor network? Um, uh, job creation has become one of the main uh, focus areas for domestic impact investments. Uh, a significant uh, percentage of the capital that is, uh, that is flowing within the United States has as an impact thesis uh, the creation of jobs. Um, however, in most cases, the, um, uh, the, the most relevant metric is really still the number of jobs, right? How many jobs are being created? without much attention um, to the quality of those jobs and to the opportunities for advancement, to the opportunities for ownership. Um, we will uh, get into that a little bit with, uh, with Anair's presentation uh, on uh, what uh, their experience at Pi has been as uh, limited partners um, reviewing uh, potential funds and fund managers um, that were focused on, uh, on good job creation. Uh, another uh, important aspect for us for, uh, to, to focus on this uh, as, a, um, as a community of practice of investors is really because there is a particularly good business case for the creation of good uh, jobs, um, which moves us fortunately away a little bit from the somewhat tired debate around uh, um, uh, the, the trade-offs between uh, impact and uh, financial returns. Uh, and here, really, we have uh, one of the clearest instances where the two go hand in hand, right? The, the creation of good jobs, treating employees as assets and not just as a, as a cost for companies. Um, and um, again, that will, uh, that will be part of the presentation. And uh, lastly, yeah, uh, this is an opportunity for us, I think, to start moving a deep conversation around impact, the way it's measured and the way that it's managed, away from uh, uh, the more traditional emphasis perhaps on specific products and um, and services right the, the, that approach to impact that is uh, predicated on uh, investing in a particular sector such as renewables or water and sanitation or in a particular geography and uh, and instead looking at, uh, at it as something that can really pervade the entirety of um, uh, of an investment practice uh, so uh, how are we looking at this? Um, part of it is, you know, a lot of the work that has been done in the United States around, um, around job quality is done at the direct uh, company level. So uh, the workforce development practitioners, um, workers' rights advocates, etc., oftentimes engage directly with a company around the, the quality of the jobs that that company is creating. Our sense, since we take this, um, this lens that really finance is one of the main uh, drivers um, within, uh, within the world that we inhabit and one of the main opportunities for, for real transformative social change is that by engaging directly at the investor level, uh, both with the, um, with the asset owners themselves and with the fund managers, there would be a, a very interesting leverage opportunity to, to really scale up the, um, the contribution to, to good job creation. So moving from the really fundamental engagements like the fight for 15 or engagement around, uh, um, uh, around benefits with uh, Walmart, Coca-Cola and McDonald's 
to um, to really this uh, this broader base of uh, of impact uh, by engaging with the uh, with the investors themselves. Uh, the second aspect that is important for us is this what sometimes I'm hearing referred to as uh, metrics 2.0, uh, right? This idea of um, managing the impact that one is measuring versus just measuring it and taking it as a as a fixed uh, um, as a fixed figure. Uh, so really looking into the the rearview mirror as a way of informing our practice going forward and focusing on that opportunity for additionality uh, in the impact through our investment. So not just saying, okay, these are the best in class companies that are out there. We're going to put our money there, but really saying, we have a role besides capitalizing companies also to um, uh, also to um, to help them along in um, uh, in improving their practices. Sorry for the hesitation. I just got a note that some folks are not seeing the slides. Um, I understand some people are seeing the deck, some are not. Uh, if you are having a problem with it, feel free to speak up or let me know in the chat and we'll see if we can uh, if we can fix that. Uh, An air team, you guys are seeing the slides, right? Yeah, correct. We are. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, sorry about that difficulty that might be happening for some. So yeah, we're talking about the uh, managing the impact versus just uh, versus just measuring it. Um, and uh, and using it really as a as a starting point to deepen a practice and to have uh, and to have additionality in that way, um, and the uh, and the last uh, the last point yeah uh, which I mentioned before is this uh, opportunity to increase the impact uh, even outside of what it could be conceived as uh, as traditional impact investors um, and into investors more generally, folks that would not consider themselves necessarily impact funds, because job creation, of course, is, a, is an element of, um, uh, of, all, of all investments. Um, so here was one suggestion. If you would like to uh, send me your email address, I can forward the, the deck to you right now, and, uh, and you can follow along uh, in that way. Um, so let's, um, uh, let's move it to, to Anair. Anair has really been one of the great thought leaders on this, uh, together with um, his colleague uh, Morgan Simon at Pi Investments. Um, and he will go through a little bit uh, the engagement that they had with, uh, with Huntington Capital um, and the, the work that we at Transform Finance did together with, uh, with Pi and Huntington to get to, um, to better um, quality job practices. So thanks for joining us on air. Uh, yeah, thanks, Andrea. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll go into a little bit of context um, about sort of our work at, at Pi, sort of how we, we've approached uh, job quality, um, and then how we've engaged with, with Huntington Capital, and then kind of pass the baton on to uh, Tim and hope to, to get into more of the details of how uh, of, of, of the impact framework and how it's being implemented. Um, so I'll start, let me see if I can flip the pages here, yeah. Um, so starting with a little bit of context about Pi Investments, for those of you who are, who are maybe not familiar, um, you know, Pi, we, we invest on behalf of a, a single family. Uh, there is a 100% mandate on um, in, uh, into impact investing across a portfolio, across asset classes. And we don't really define our focus um, as being um, um, really around specific themes or sectors. Uh, we're, we're really focused on uh, s strategies that sort of challenge or address the underlying sort of economic structures um, that um, you know, that, that create both social and, and environmental challenges that drive both sort of social inequality and environmental degradation and, and climate change. So it kind of cuts across um, to a lot of sectors. And so on the environmental side, we like to talk about environmental sufficiency, uh, which is really thinking about how we reduce con resource consumption, how we sort of rethink consumption behavior. Uh, so, you know, rather than just thinking about efficiency and just thinking about um, 
sort of more advanced technologies that help us kind of use resources more efficiently. Just really thinking about how we uh, how we engage with uh, how we use resources, and then on the social uh, side, we uh, we look at empowering historically disadvantaged communities, and and we try to think about. Um, we look for for strategies that have at least the, sort of the potential to have transformative uh, impact on livelihood. So as opposed to sort of you know very kind of small incremental changes, um, there is there is really a an attempt to to to, to, to see if strategies have the uh, the potential to you know lift communities out of poverty and have real 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 transformative change. Um, so, with that in mind, um, so how how do we you know how do we think about job creation strategies and and the importance of jobs? So obviously, you know, jobs are important in you know lifting and you know, creating economic opportunity and lifting communities out of poverty. But we we tend to be a little bit skeptical uh, about strategies that that are are sort of solely focused on the notion of job creation. Uh, because, you know, sort of simply put, if you create low income jobs in low income communities. Um, you're, you're not you're not necessarily creating uh, the kinds of jobs that will break the the, the poverty cycles in, in those communities. And you know there's uh, plenty of uh, you know examples of you know corporations we know that are creating a lot of jobs in in low in, for for low income communities, be it Walmart or, or McDonald's. And those those jobs are not necessarily um, you know changing. Um, uh, you know, or, or really improving livelihoods for those for those communities. So, so we basically think that you know, when when there's a strategy that focuses on really just job creation without any quality standards, we're it, it's sort of assuming that the issue is is that we're facing is an unemployment problem, and we think the bigger issue is 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 the issue of the working poor. So it's an employment problem. So it's the fact that um, that the minimum wage. Um, you know, as it is, does that doesn't uh, afford, uh, doesn't provide for a living wage uh, to a family. And there's a you know, data point here around how a you know a typical family of, of of four to earn a living wage needs to work more than three full time minimum wage jobs. And uh, another sort of relevant uh, data point is I think um, you know two thirds of the uh, children who live in in poverty live in families. Where at least one of the parents is working, um, so 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 you know, really, if we're not addressing the if the, the question of, of job quality, we're not you know we're, we're not helping those um, uh, those communities. So the focus we really what we really focus is on migrating from lower quality to higher quality jobs, versus just you know counting counting jobs, which is sort of what where, where as Andrea framed the conversation is is where a lot of um, the conversation typically. You know, often often stops, um, uh, and I'll just mention. I mean, within that, there is a, a strong emphasis that we have around distributed democratic ownership models, because in, in some ways, I mean, that really ensures that there's a fairness and that there is a uh, uh, appropriate sort of sharing of both the risk and and upside with uh, with the workers. And so when we look at, and so as I mentioned, I mean, we have a, a, a full portfolio that we look to allocate. I mean, we're looking for strategies that are, we're investing in direct link companies, we're, we're investing in venture capital and late stage private equity and real assets. And, and when we look for strategies across a portfolio that, um, you know, that address these challenges or that, you know, or that, that have a uh, sort of job creation focus with, with, that, with that sort of uh, quality lens or emphasis, it, it's, a, it's a pretty limited, uh, I would argue it's a pretty limited uh, universe right now. Um, I would say our experience, and I'd be happy to hear if others at some point chime in here and have uh, other, other examples and always happy to look at new ones. But in general, we would argue, you know, CDFIs are probably, you know, the primary sort of sources of capital with that mandate, um, you know, that we see out there. Um, I would argue, though, you know, the issue with CDFIs, from that perspective, is well, one is they're they're typically limited to very specific kinds of capital, so typically senior secured debt, so they don't really uh, provide uh, flexible growth capital. Um, you know, and then also the fact that most CDFIs are are more heavily focused on 
uh, affordable housing than, than than job creation strategies. Certainly, certainly some of them are are moving in that direction. But um, and then if we look sort of beyond the universe of CDFIs and we look at private equity, venture capital managers, the, the you know the list is 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 not I don't you know it's not very long. And we you know, we have a couple other investments and in, uh, you know, or investors in. Uh, in an early stage fund called Impact America that's focused on uh, supporting um, social entrepreneurs of color, primarily um, you know, Bridges Ventures. You know, there, there are a couple of others, but it's, you know, if, you, if you flip through the uh, list and the Impact Assets 50 uh, sort of top you know, impact funds, you're, you're not going to find, I think, many names that, that have th th that focus. Uh -huh. um, and so when we, you know, when we came across and we met the team at Huntington Capital, we were, you know, obviously really, um, sorry, is someone in, was somebody jumping in with a question or comment or, um, you know, obviously really, you know, really excited about what we saw. I mean, they're, they're you know, very strong team and de delivering, you know, really great performance. Uh, there's a focus on, on a really underserved part of the market you know, in general, sort of low to middle market kind of private equity is 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 a, is a bit a bit less of a is a bit of an underserved market, but even more so when when there is this focus on sort of lower income communities, and they've had taught, you know they 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 had deployed well you know you, you'll you'll hear, you'll hear from Tim and Hope in a little bit, but um you know they they've had top core performance, um they've had you know one of the best performing MES funds for for their vintage year for the second fund was two thousand and eight. Uh, and what we what we were hearing also across the board, and I think this is actually quite relevant to how to the conversation in terms of uh, the impact developing the impact framework, is that they have you know fantastic reputation with management teams. Who, you know, love to work with them, and and it, we we think that is also really contributing to their the quality of their their deal flow from their management teams and kind of proprietary source of deal flow, and then also really strong reputation with their with their LPs, and they have you know really great institutional LPs. City HSBC, um, and um, and not and, and a great reputation. Not I mean obviously because they performed well, but also I think a reputation for being uh, open and receptive to you know working with their LPs, which I think again really relevant. I think in the context of what we were doing here. Um, and and the other thing they were I think kind of well reputed for and known for is. Oh, very strong uh, and disciplined uh, impact reporting. You know, um, many of their LPs have a um, requ require them to to, to report uh, on some of these metrics uh, due to sort of CRA as part of their CRA uh, mandate. Um, and and you know, we we kind of universally heard that Huntington is capital is a uh, is is an example for a really great um, you know really great manager in terms of, of tracking those metrics and so here's some of the some of the metrics that they were reporting out of their first two funds um, uh, you know, again the, the percent of the companies that are in low low to moderate income regions the percent of the, the employees that are that are low to moderate income or or of color um, so kind of some of the some of the metrics that were um, we're seeing out of the first couple of uh, funds, uh, but what we but we, we felt that there was an opportunity um, in the in in this kind of next fund as they were going out to market again it, to take the impact their impact to the next level and uh, really ask sort of two questions more more deeply. Uh, so one is how good are these jobs? Uh, you, know, you know, are they uh, providing living wages? Uh, benefits, you know, ownership opportunities, advancement, paid leave, uh, and then are they getting better um, thanks to their, you know, Huntington Capital's involvement? Are they moving along? Are those jobs getting better over time? So I mean, we think about as, as as investors, are we are we having an impact? Um, and so when we when we brought those questions up to to, to the team at at, at Huntington. I think what we found is that they, you know, we, we found them at, at sort of a the kind of the good timing in that they were thinking about ways to 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 move to that next to to move that to that next level and raise the bar on impact. And there was a strategic commitment from the team to to to, to kind of push the envelope. But at the same time, 
uh, I think there's there's a sensitivity and there is a to to kind of make sure that you're doing it right. Um, and you know you have stakeholders, you have your portfolio companies, you have your LPs. Uh, you know you want to make sure that you're not creating um, uh, a, a burden on portfolio companies that they can't meet, uh, or that you're uh, turning away portfolio companies. Uh, you want to be sensitive to uh, your LPs and you know make sure that this is being done uh, and it's being presented as a uh, with a strong you know business case. And it's not that we're uh, to you know to 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 Andrea's point earlier. Uh, that you're doing this because you really believe it's going to drive, continue to drive performance in your portfolio, and not because it's um, uh, going to do the, the opposite, right? Um, um, so, so, so those, and, and I think that's a that's a part, a point in the conversation that we 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 often see. I think as LPs is that when you ask these questions around impact, you know, more often than not, there's um, the the management teams are you know are receptive are they, they want to move in this direction, but there's often sort of this question, well, all right, well, we love to, we love, we love to do this, but not quite sure how, and we want to make sure that we're doing it responsibly. And, and, you know, can, can you, you know, can you support us as well? And we can, we kind of work on this together. So this is sort of the, the, the case here. And um, what we did at that point uh, with, uh, with, with the help of, of, of Andrea in this case and, and transform finance, is to start with building a, uh, a a list or defining kind of best practices that where we could really point to the business case and how they were driving business performance. So you know the extent to which um, you know paid leave or, or better wages were reducing turnover and increasing productivity, and really focus on on a relatively limited number of factors that that are both important to. Uh, to workers and to job quality, and um, and we think are sort of accretive to, to business performance. And we, again, probably get into more of the specifics of what what those were with uh, I think with with Hope and and Tim here in a minute. Um, and then and then the other the other piece uh, to sort of complement this kind of research piece around well what you know what are the what are some of the metrics that we should focus on from a quality perspective. Um, was to bring in some of the LPs to the conversation and you know make sure that we're you know that they're that they are in alignment and that we're not you know kind of running forward with with some ideas that we then go back and present to LPs and they're like oh wait a minute you know what are you doing so there in this case there's a there were there were we started with sort of a handful of LPs that we already had relationships with and knew that were they were you know, kind of other impact focused LPs and they're really aligned uh, around this work. And, uh, you know, Heron Foundation has been an, an LP, I think, in a, in a couple of the, the funds here. And um, obviously, a very strong focus on these same issues. And uh, Blue Haven was another one. Um, so, we had these conversations again of kind of really with the st stakeholders to make sure that we're bringing them along. Um, and so, yeah, so, so I, I, I'd kind of transition this, I, I'll hand this over to, to Tim and Hope here in a minute. And just to emphasize, I mean, the, the two pieces we really focused on is, you know, A, defining what are the, the quality standards or the metrics that really matter and drive business performance, and B, um, try to come up with a, a spectrum um, that is, um, well, that enables uh, companies to, um, it doesn't set the bar excessively, you know, or unrealistically high for every company from the get-go, but where there is a the opportunity to see an evolution and a progression over time, uh, and you know, and and for for the investors for Huntington Capital in this in this in, in this uh, instance to be a part or to play a role in that progression over time. Um, so I'm gonna pause there. Hmm. I don't know if we still have, do we have Andrea here? Because it seems like. Yes, hi, sorry. I, I'm calling in by phone now. Apparently my my computer uh, got tired of it. Um, so I, I am with you. I won't be able to move the slides, however. So uh, team and an air, please feel free to um, take care of those yourselves. Sure, so, I, I think we can um, handle moving the slides um, on our side here. Yeah. And if anybody has any comments or questions for now on uh, what Anair said so far, uh, feel free to chime in. You can raise the flag or put it in the chat or just 
speak up. Okay, well, um, Anner, thank you very much for the um, kind of the, the background and the introduction. Uh, it's been great working with you and Morgan Simon, um, you know, contributing to kind of, um, you know, our next stage or next phase rather of, of impact uh, intentionality. Um, it's definitely an ongoing uh, work in progress here. We've certainly received some nice accolades, but um, this is an evolving space. And like Anna said, we're, we're very open to working with our limited partners and, and our other constituents to continue to, to, to evolve the investment strategy and, and um, collaborate with other funds. We're happy to do that as well. So thank you. Uh, the slide you we have here is just a quick background on us for the folks uh, who are on the phone. We're, we're been in business uh, since 2001. We've had three funds. We're currently investing out of our third fund. Uh, our strategy is to focus on providing mezzanine debt and equity <clears throat> to underserved lower middle market companies. These are uh, typically businesses that are small businesses, uh, 10 to 50 to $75 million in revenue. They're underserved by banks. They're underserved by private equity firms. And so there's an abundance of opportunities for us uh, in this marketplace, even despite the fact that today uh, we're seeing um, more lending from banks and we're seeing uh, even more lending from small business investment funds that are being created. Uh, so, uh, by way of background, our first fund was an SBIC, and as everyone probably knows, an SBIC's main mission is to create jobs. Um, it's a small business association-backed um, investment vehicle. Uh, we invested $42 million out of that fund, and the real genesis for us was, uh, and the founding partners really was to you know, fill this gap in the marketplace and in, in the small business lending marketplace, uh, but also have a positive effect on the community. Uh, the founder, Dick Huntington, was an entrepreneur and very successful, and he had done well, and he knew how difficult it was to try and find money as a small business. And uh, so he helped create this fund with my partner, Morgan Miller, to really you know, solve that gap in the market, but also give back to the community. So that was really the genesis of, of who we are at Huntington. And I think it, it continues 15 years later. Uh, you know, as our, our real mission here at Huntington is to make um, above market rate returns and, and have a favorable impact on the community as a basis for, for who we were when we started the firm. In 2008, we, uh, Founded, uh, we started our second fund, which was an all-institutional $78 million fund. And we took the kind of the, the core genesis of, of who we are uh, and the mission of the firm. And at that time, as everyone knows, it was called the social, Socially Responsible Fund uh, Strategy, or that was the acronym, I guess, then for impact funds. And we looked at it and said, you know, this is really who we are. And so we worked with a number of our institutional investors and insurance companies and banks and some foundations like the Heron Foundation early on. And we started to, to you know, really get serious about um, data collecting and investing into small businesses that were located in low to moderate income zones or employed a significant amount of low to moderate income employees. And we really were able to, to do a great job of, of um, you know, investing in those types of businesses and, and collecting quite a bit of data around those those businesses. Um, I'm hearing a little bit of background noise. Is there someone who has a question or should I continue? Okay. I think it was just background. I'm going to mute everybody for now okay. and then unmute when the time for questions comes. Sure. So uh, that was a 2008 vintage. In, in 2013, 2014, we raised our third fund. Um, it's a $92 million vehicle. And with the help of uh, a number of our institutional investors, foundations, um, and in particular, uh, Anner and, and Morgan Simon, we 
we really wanted to, to continue to evolve our impact strategy and, you know, take it to the next level. And we're open to that. And we really kind of wanted to, to be more intentional. So not changing our investment strategy, it's still on underserved small businesses at 10 to $75 million in revenue, but to basically be, you know, more intentional um, from a governance standpoint, uh, from a communication standpoint, from an influence standpoint on the businesses that we're funding um, to really try to help generate more and better jobs, um, jobs uh, through training and so forth. So we can actually have a low to moderate income job potentially um, migrate over time uh, into management. Um, and so that's where we really kind of spent a fair amount of time coming up with what we'll walk you through here is this impact intentionality and, and our impact ladder. So we can set kind of a baseline ladder for each company and, and work with them over a period of time while we're involved with the business to try and enhance the outcomes for, for the employees, just like we're trying to enhance the outcome for our investors in terms of return, which is, um, the first and, and most important part of what we're doing is, is working towards um, the return side of the equation, but really create a, um, an impact value um, plan for the company in similar fashion as we create an economic value plan for the companies we work with. Keep in mind that we are not a control investor at Huntington. So uh, one thing that's, um, you know, interesting and attractive for a small business owner for us is, is we're coming in with a mezzanine loan or some sort of equity instrument, but by and large, we're not in a control um, seat. Uh, we, we may have a board seat or an observer position, but we're not able to just walk into a company and say, um, you are going to do these things that we would like you to do from a, a social or employment standpoint. But it's, it's really about influence and it's also about picking the management teams that, that you know, have those core values. And I think it does start with the core values of, of a Huntington Capital. It's similar to the companies that we fund and finance. We're seeking investment teams and management teams, rather, that, that match and align their core values with our core values. So um, it, it shouldn't be... Um, uh, a, a difficult situation for us to work with these co portfolio companies to implement um, more intentional kinds of impact strategies. And I'm here with my associate, Hope Mago, and I'm going to ask him to kind of take you through some of these in a little bit more detail. Hopefully you can see this, uh, the prints a little small. Uh, thanks, Tim. And before we dive into the slide, what I'll probably do is give a little background on how the impact intentionality framework came about. And uh, really this was kind of evolved from the feedback we got from our LPs and in the market and where fund two had been recognized for it's a strong reporting and monitoring capabilities and how that had allowed us to build a great database and build a compelling and tell a compelling impact story and allowed us also to participate in building the body of knowledge in the impact investing space through various case studies and research initiatives from various folk. Um, the natural progression as we went to the market in fund three and the conversations we had really focused on how do we move to drive outcomes, uh, impact intentionality versus outputs, which we had done well, the monitoring, tracking and reporting piece and really start building and how do we take our com portfolio company and the workforce and help take those low paying jobs and build more impact intentionality and build a road roadmap that the company could go along over the coming years during our investment period. And hopefully we could get to, you know, greater outcomes that would impact the portfolio companies and leave by the time we exited, have more sustainable impact across the company. And really the, the, the intent in adopting the flow and ladder approach as a framework was really, we wanted to make sure we get input from the portfolio companies as we look to build this roadmap and framework and really get engagement from the management teams, get their alignment, get their, their input and make sure we're working with them as we put together a plan that would expect them to execute over the, the timeframe of our investment period. 
And the five key themes we focused on that kind of tie into job quality engagement and improved job outcomes were one, really a focus on broad-based participation. So helping portfolio companies develop frameworks and plans around how we could get more wealth creation mechanisms broadly uh, distributed across the entire workforce. Another key area for us was opportunities for advancement. So how, what are portfolio companies providing employees to get them from the lowest rungs in wage, in the wage metrics of the company, help them on a path to potentially participate and grow into management roles. And that was really built around uh, what job training programs are in place, what funds are being set up aside to help create, help play, pay for employees training programs. And then also with input from Pi and Transform Finance, uh, work around living wage standards, right? How do we, because I think one of the key themes that we, we kind of have determined is that paying a living wage reduces turnover, which is a, you know, a huge cost, especially for smaller businesses. And it also increases employee morale and job engagement and well-being. And so that was a key area we wanted to spend time on. And then around health and well-being, a focus on paid sick days and also the presence of additional health benefits at the portfolio company. And what you see with the value creation plan, and really this kind of steps back to how our values and our intent here is really, we believe that sustainable impact is really tied to value creation. And so what we try and do is at entry, you know, when we're carrying out our diligence process and doing our foundational analysis is really focus on what are the financial and impact KPIs we want to work on with the portfolio company as we try to build a value creation roadmap. And that feeds into our impact insight and performance improvement metrics, uh, where we pass out what areas we want to work on around impact with the portfolio company, what financial and economic metrics you want to work with with the company, and that will help lead into sustained value creation. And then that be, builds into an expanded focus where we're trying to drive impact and KPI sustainability up, across the portfolio company and potentially upon when we do get to an exit event, uh, the values and mission and everyone's aligned around what the focus is and what we've tried to create. And hopefully it's, it's sustainable and lives beyond Huntington's investment period. Mm -hmm. And what the next slide kind of walks you through is how we are looking at the floor and ladder approach. And really for, from our perspective, when we're looking at the floor, this is really in our diligence period. So what you find is our portfolio companies at that point, either they already fulfill certain minimum industry standards around job quality, or we, they engage with Huntington Capital in discussions to refine or identify, or in some cases create such standards that would help the company execute on. And then in cases where no formal standards exist in that sector or the area the company works in, uh, Huntington Capital will of, with uh, help from outside consultants will attempt to assist the company in creating those standards that we would like to see the company implement. And then what really what the ladder does is it provides a roadmap around how we expect over the next four or five years of our investment period, how we expect the company to progress through uh, those metrics we'll be tracking. And then on an annual basis, we evaluate the impact plan. Uh, we have conversations with the team, see what they've managed to execute on, where they failed, uh, lessons learned, and how we can assist them in uh, achieving in those areas where they've been deficient. And in areas where they've overperformed or out outperformed how we can take some of those lessons to our other portfolio companies and help them kind of meet those same metrics. And then really what the next slide shows you is, uh, this is more our value creation plan, uh, where it's built off our initial diligence considerations. Uh, so you see, this is uh, an example of how we would approach the process, right? Uh, under e economic, uh, impact themes, uh, we've got a list of uh, what we initially look at and consider in a certain portfolio company. And then also on health and wellness, we'd have a couple metrics we'd be tracking, like paid time off, vacation days, uh, comprehensive health benefits, and health plans, ETC. 
And then we'll have, we draft an impact assessment plan based on the five uh, impact teams I mentioned earlier. And then we'll score those against what the industry or sector standard is. And then we'll try build the company to achieve more or at the end of our time frame, be exceeding what is the industry standard. And then what the next frame a column would show is where the value creation opportunities lie. And we try and build an improvement plan that ties into a monitoring plan that we work with in executing those uh, social and financial outcomes we're looking to, to achieve in the process. And then the, the final slide, this is more along the value creation, uh, which as we mentioned is obviously a key component of building sustainable impact. And likewise with the impact value creation plan, we look at what the key risks in this and the opportunity are, what the key strengths are. Uh, we build our investment thesis based on what we've noticed as key risks, how we mitigate those, where the key strengths are, key strengths lie, how we build on those. <clears throat> And that leads to our value creation opportunities. And we split those out into what we can monitor and what we can influence. And those we build on either to drive growth, optimization and efficiency, which will lead to improved business outcomes at the portfolio company level. And it might be a good time now, um, uh, Andre, to, to open up for questions or um, your call? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to unmute uh, uh, all the folks on the phone and uh, the ones that are joining from within the app should be able to unmute themselves. Or that we eliminated prior to delivery. Try to identify. Yeah, and I mean, frankly, they should have like given that I have a receipt for that amount. I would have, you know, they should have corrected it. <laughs> Hello. people unmute themselves individually okay. uh yeah let me see here if i can uh override them somehow uh, all right great seems like we found the culprit or not all right do we have uh, do we have any questions mm -hmm. All right, we, we yes. do have a we do have a question while I try to mute that person uh, saying um, yes. Uh, we have a question from Flory. Let me unmute. Um, yes, actually, just recently, <laughs> it's been a bad month. Um, somebody put a tip on my credit card, and I'd already tipped them in cash, and they never disclosed to me that they were going to tip. So, yes. Well, I hope that we resolve that to your satisfaction as well. Yes, you did. Thank you. Goodness. Okay, great. So there we go. Here. No? Still? All right, great. Uh, Flory, you said you have a question, and, and uh, I think you are unmuted. I do, yes. Okay, all right, perfect. Oh, goodness. Okay, I, ju I just muted some right. people. So I think maybe that's... Okay, thank you. Um, yes, we were trying to, to mute everyone, and uh, I can't hear Flory. Flory, if you tell me which one is your telephone number, I can unmute yours. Feel free to put it here in the chat, just the first few digits. Okay, 269, let me find you. Hi, right. can you hear me now? Hi, Flori. Thank you. Thanks for your Excellent. patience with that. <laughs> I'm glad we were able to make that work. Um, thanks so much. First, I just want to thank you all for you know leading uh, this conversation. I know you did a convening a few weeks ago at Ford Foundation, and I wasn't able to join, um, but I think it's 
you know, heartening to see the number of participants in this conversation and the level of interest around creating really good job quality standards that LPs, GPs, and uh, companies can all be coalescing around. Um, and Hope, thank you so much for walking us through the framework that you implemented. Um, you know, a lot of the metrics that you highlighted as being part of your job quality framework that you're applying at the company level harmonize really nicely with the data that we collect in the B Impact Assessment and that feed into Gears Ratings and Huntington Capital is a Gears Rated Fund. I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts on, um, you know, actually, let me step back for a moment and just say this this kind of conversation and engagement around not only collecting data, but using it to manage for impact and amplify impact at the portfolio company level and at the fund level is exactly what we are um, working to scale out and make easier for fund managers to do with the investment that we're making in the platforms um, at B-Lab and our company portals and our fund portals. And so my question is, recognizing that it does feel like there is some good consensus around what data feeds into good job quality standards. What can we do uh, across the industry to kind of streamline the conversations that you're having with your portfolio companies to help them set specific targets and then work towards those targets over time? Because that's absolutely something we would like to be able to then build into our own platform so that all funds are doing this. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Flory. Um, I think from our perspective, one of the, the, the great things that Gears allows us to do is really uh, see how our portfolio companies are stacked up against uh, their peers in uh, certain sectors or industries that they operate in. Um, I think just being able to get a bit more granularity into that information and then build a, a tracking mechanism I, I think might be something we'd be interested in talking with, with your team about and really seeing how we can roll that out so that when our portfolio companies do carry out their gears assessment, maybe that's, you know, we, we get a, uh, you know, I, I know we've used the assessments for, with some of our portfolio companies as a feedback mechanism, but it, might, it would be great if we could build on that so it's all integrated on, on one platform and then we could kind of use that as, from for our internal purposes, um, developing some of the the value creation or impact intentionality frameworks. Because right now, you know, we we take the gears data and download that, and then we have to build a separate framework around how we build an impact intentionality plan with the portfolio company. So there's a couple of steps, and it'll be perfect if we could all have that on one platform. Then it's easier to track, and hopefully, it's easier for LPs as well to then have a single repository mm -hmm. of this data where they can then go to and be like, well, what's what's taking place in the space, right? I love that idea. We would love to to work with you on doing something like that. Um, and I think that point around granularity is is really important. Um, and just as a side note, one of the things that we've built into the platform in the last six months is the ability to set performance targets for the future. So there may be some new functionality that can help help you accomplish that goal. So we'll talk more offline, but just you know, thanks for answering the question. And again, thanks to everyone at Transform Finance and Pi for, for convening us. Thanks, Flory. And uh, this is Andre again. I will be going a little bit into the Job Quality Standards project towards the end of this session. And uh, Santiago um, in, on your team and I had a couple of very good conversations around it. And we are very much looking yeah, at, uh, uh, at co-developing this and finding ways in which we can, uh, we can partner with the, with the Gears platform around it. Uh, we'll, um, uh, we'll get to get there in a moment. Uh, there was a question from uh, uh, Stephanie. Let me unmute you. Can you hear Hi, me? Stephanie. Yes. Great. Uh, my, I, so I um, am with SDF Ventures, another impact investment uh, venture capital fund. And my question was around communication to portfolio companies and execution. Um, what we found we you know like like it, it sounds like like Huntington. We all of our companies take the gears assessment, and so we have like if I look at your slide, we have a lot of this data, and we sort of we encourage them to improve their worker score year to year, and then we sometimes engage on specific initiatives around um, let's say 
paid maternity leave or um, we did one on worker satisfaction surveys last year. But we have a really hard time doing anything in the between between a single initiative we push out or a broad initiative like GEARS and just kind of encouraging worker score improvement year over year. And so I'm curious how you communicate many different things you want a company to work on over time without overburdening that company, how you, know, how you communicate that in that way and, and what the reception is from companies. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. We, we do face you know, some of those challenges. I think a lot of it is really predicated. It's, it's a conversation. You know, like Tim mentioned earlier on, we're not a majority investor, so we can't come in and you know force the companies uh, to implement some of these things. But I think up front, when we are getting to know the management team and getting to know their values and their mission, and we tell the Huntington story and we, how we approach things and what our mission is, and hopefully you know they they understand that impact is important to us. And then you know we do include you know the gears uh assessment requirement as part of one of as part of our covenants but it's really a conversation we have with the portfolio companies and that's why we we try to have as much input from them when we're building the impact ladder because we know that a lot of that work that will be carried out will be from the management team and so without their buy-in it's, it's really hard to to build a framework that someone's going to implement um, so that's why we try and do a lot of work up front, but it, it's, it's a continuous conversation we have to have with them and really make sure that everyone around the table is seeing the value of what we're trying to do. And just a quick follow-up question. Are you very specific in your ladders year to year? You know, do you say either we want to see improvement on these five initiatives in years one and two and then in these other five KPIs in three and four, or we want to see improvement year over year ideally, or... Or how specific do you get in your over your target? So we we build the ladder based on the company's input, right? I'm sure the same way we approach our the covenants, we financial covenants we build is really we tell the company what the ladder and what the areas we'd like to, them to improve on look like, and then based on their input, some management teams are like, well, yeah, we you know we already have a framework around an employee stock option plan. It's just a matter of rolling it out. And then some companies have, you know, not even contemplated that idea, right? So that might, whilst one company, you might say, okay, we're giving you, uh, your floor is build out a, you know, an employee option pool. And then in year two, you know, maybe it's allocated among senior executives and there's a framework around how people exercise that. And then year three, the target is you get 50% participation across the worker pool. In some companies that might already have, a, you know, have one for the executive management team, they're already a step ahead. So their, their framework for the ladder might look different. So it's all kind of, it's predicated on where the company is at and what its needs are, pretty much. Right. If I could interject, it's, it is different for every company and they may start at different levels of the ladder, so to speak, right? And our goal is to move them up. Um, we may be able to achieve, um, you know, level three, level four on broad-based participation over a, you know, we're looking kind of during the life of our investment. Um, you know, they may not be able to achieve, um, you know, significant progress in one area. So uh, because this is not a, a mandatory or because we're not in control, um, we're going to have these these various levels, and and we want to see progress in 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 these areas. Um, again, some may, you know, show better progress than, than others over time. But it's really setting it. Where is the company today, and how can we help the company improve while we're involved with the business? And, that and makes just sense. To, just to add a, another quick comment to to that as well. I think. Um, you know, as as Hope and, and Tim are saying, I mean, this is it should be a conversation. It should be different for for different companies based on demographics, based on needs and the context. In one in one company, one uh, you know maternity leave to for, to use your example, Stephanie might be a big issue. And another company, maybe it's uh, 
uh, predictability and extra in overtime and uh, work hours and work schedules. Or uh, I think that needs to be come out of those conversations and to uh, tie this back to some of like the transform finance sort of principles. I mean, you know, Andrea mentioned we are you know, sort of here because we believe finance has sort of a role to to, to play in, in pushing these changes, but we also we also believe that it should be informed by the you know by the people by the workers. Um, so you know, ideally, this isn't coming. And going back to this point about this isn't about a an investor that's in control and that's saying here's the five things you need to do. Uh, hopefully, it is it is being informed by what the workers what is most important to the workers as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thank you for the questions and uh, thank you, um, Hope, Tim, and Onair for, for addressing them. Um, if there are no other questions at the another, moment, maybe... There was another question here in the chat, Andrea. Um, oh, let me see. I saw the one from Stephanie and the one from Flory. Let's see if um, there are any other ones. Polina? I don't see There's further up in the chat. Uh, Pol Pol is it Polina or Polina? Um, is the information you require to create your impact ladder obtained during the underwriting process? That was a question. OK, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Is the, in uh, sorry, I was muted. is the information you require to create your impact ladder obtained during the underwriting process? Uh, yeah, so w when we're going through the diligence process, we, we collect some preliminary data from the portfolio companies around workforce wages, zip codes, ETC, um, and then we have a conversation with the management teams as we're going through the diligence process around um, which areas uh, they're implementing um, around uh, the key impact themes we focus on, and that feeds into our value creation and impact intentionality plan. So yeah, answer is yes. It, it's happening in, in the uh, in the diligence process up front, right? Great. All right. So um, unless there are other questions from anybody, and uh, if you're having problems uh, uh, giving the questions through the chat. Uh, just shoot me a quick email at andrea at transformfinance.org. I will check that in a moment and I will um, uh, and I will put the put the question to our speakers. Uh, meanwhile, I thought, yeah, in light of the type of questions that came up, it might be a good moment to uh, start um, um, giving a little uh, quick review of how this fits within the context of the Job Quality Standards Project. We're very excited to, to work with uh, Huntington and with Pi on uh, on their engagement around this and contributing both to the creation of the of the business case and of the uh, floor and ladder approach what we would like to see though is given how well this worked out and uh, the presentation today sort of demonstrated um, how how that took place is can we move beyond you know one LP and one fund and turn this into something that is uh, more generalized across the yeah. industry right? What uh, uh, what can we do to support uh, investors in general to uh, to do this, and uh, with the um, uh, with the support so far from the Ford Foundation and uh, from the Certna Foundation, we we developed this uh, this project with a fairly broad coalition of uh, of actors that is aimed at uh, strengthening the business case really to because that is uh, that is fundamental from the from the fund manager perspective as well as for the lps that are um that are looking at the um, at investing for quality job creation um refining what the standards are and landing on a, a more uh, sort of comprehensive uh, approach where everybody can be on board on, on, on what they are. There is a broad consensus um, in terms of the various categories of uh, wage, benefits, opportunities for advancement, and uh, opportunities for ownership. Um, but uh, there, is, uh, there is still work to be done to, to refine yeah, what, does, uh, what the standards are like. And then uh, to, to go towards uh, Stephanie's question uh, from SJF around uh, implementation, really, 
it seems to us, and this is like uh, probably the general transform finance approach, you know, that just uh, uh, putting out there um, an idea of what uh, what this uh, sort of ultimate goal would be becomes a lot more uh, helpful if there is an implementation strategy, a, a blueprint around it. And uh, those are some of the tools that we are currently working on. And I would invite anybody that is um, in, uh, in this community of practice that is following the webinar right now to, uh, to chime in uh, with what they have seen as, um, as working and, um, and really say, you know, we are here now. We're trying to get to this, uh, to this higher level over time. There are certain things that have um, demonstrated that they are uh, particularly solid in terms of the uh, of the implementation, and uh, looking in that context at uh, what needs to um, what other resources need to be provided. Are the resources needed more at the at the company level? Is it more uh, tools to um, to help the the fund managers themselves? Uh, figure out uh, how to get into these conversations again, taking the model that uh, that Huntington uh, has used and that Hope just explained in terms of uh, how that engagement uh, goes. Uh, because our ultimate goal there really is to get things done, right? We want to see more capital flowing uh, flowing in this way. So the idea around this project is what do we need to do in order to to do that. Um, and uh, if uh, if there are any um, uh, any uh, points either from the people that have already been involved with the with the Ford meeting or throughout or or anybody else um, in terms of what you have seen working other instances perhaps of uh, funds that have uh, that have done this sort of engagement with. Uh, uh, with their portfolio companies, We'd, I'd love to hear them now. Uh, I can put them in the chat if you'd like, and I will try for a moment to unmute everybody in case the folks on the phone have questions. And hopefully we won't have a background noise problem now. Okay, now you're all unmuted. If anybody would uh, would like to, to ask a question, please feel free to go ahead. And I might have to remute people if there is too much background noise. Any any questions or maybe some more comments from uh, from Huntington or from Pi around uh, around the project and why you've been uh, excited about it and you know you've been extremely supportive from the from the get go with this. Uh, maybe uh, you can give us a little bit of your perspective, respectively, as um, as LP and as uh, and as fund manager um, around yeah how you would like to see this. Uh, been developed and applied more broadly throughout the industry. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, go sorry. ahead, Anner. Well, I mean, from our perspective, I mean, obviously, um, just as there's a there's an element to this that is different by for. For Huntington, as they work uh, with portfolio companies, there is an element to this that's different for every, uh, you know, LP fund manager or fund manager conversation, right? And you know, Huntington is is um, has a certain strategy and um, certain sectors and and other and it may or may not apply to uh, what what um, uh, Stephanie is doing at SJF or or others are doing at DBL or you know other other funds. So. Uh, so obviously, I mean, there is a desire to to try and you know apply this sort of thinking to, to other cases as well. And we, you know, we cannot. It's not something we can feel like we have the capacity or or knowledge to to to, to take on on an individual um, basis with you know a repeated basis with 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 every fund manager. So we, you know, we appreciate that there is sort of a community of other fund managers and other LPs that are interested and. 
um, you know, want to want to see how this can apply um, more broadly. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. I think um, it, it's, it's certainly applicable to what we do and the market that we're in. Um, uh, it's very applicable, obviously, to small businesses and you know, growing emerging growth companies. Um, so it's kind of sector based. I, I think that SJF, um, you know, has a, a slightly different investment strategy, but is also working with lower middle market companies in, in general. So I think it's applicable for kind of both of us in terms of our target markets. I think it's, um, uh, you know, just this awareness and, and, trying not to do too much. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to, what we like about what we've come up with is it's, it's, um, it's narrow enough. Um, albeit it's, it's broad in, in, in some of the things we're trying to do, but to communicate it to the portfolio companies, it's narrow enough to sit down and talk to them about it and they can understand it. And I think if, if we can, together as a community of LPs and, and fund managers who are, are focused on this to, to just create more awareness, um, try to keep it um, simple enough that, that other fund managers can hopefully adopt it and, and start utilizing it. I do think there's a, quite a bit of fund managers out there who agree that if you're taking care of your employees, um, and you're conscientious about, you know, your, your, um, your values and your business and, and how, you know, um, your business runs, um, how you treat people. Uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of fun managers out there that are, that are probably doing a lot of this just and, and aren't really, um, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, creatively bringing, you know, bringing it to the, the forefront of, of really what they do. So I, I think as we can, as a community, try to uh, bring more awareness to it and refine the, the, the parameters around, you know, around the key themes of, of um, better jobs and job quality standards. Um, I think you can have other firms start adopting this and, and just being more, um, being more um, active in, in, in implementation and, and governance. And so that's my, my thought process on it. I think it's evolving, but things like this and, and what we're doing here, um, sharing these, these ideas and these strategies. And um, you know, if, if there are other ways to do it that are better, but I think if you want broader adoption, you have to create the awareness and you have to keep it uh, for fund managers who are really trying to create you know, get the best possible returns for their investors. This takes time and, you know, we're hiring, we'll have an impact associate join our team in, in about less than 45 days um, because it takes time and it's, it, it, it is a commitment and it is um, an investment that you do need to make. But, but those are some of my comments about, about kind of where we are, I think, in the, in the um, realm of the, the rollout of, of more impact intentionality. Thanks, Tim. I will uh, make a couple of uh, comments on that. This is Andre again. Can you guys hear me? Great. Uh, we have first another question from Angel, uh, I believe at uh, CalPERS, uh, saying, have you all found that uh, there are particular industries or sectors that are especially receptive to job quality issues, or some that are particularly res uh, resistant, or does it really just depend on the individual management teams? Um, I will mention uh, in this regard some of the efforts that the Hitachi Foundation has uh, done, I believe, uh, focusing on uh, healthcare and manufacturing domestically as two of the areas that have been particularly receptive um, around job quality and where there is the opportunity for, uh, for improvement uh, in, uh, in quality jobs. Uh, Tim, what would be your take on, uh, on Angel's question? Sure. Um, you know, certainly the, the four kind of areas where we focus here at Huntington, um, uh, manufacturing, and, 
uh, healthcare, um, business services, um, and and technology. And you know, for the most part, absolutely, manufacturing um, and healthcare and services um, are are areas you know where where in particular manufacturing where where you see lower level workers and um, so that that matches up very well um, we've seen obviously quite a bit of uh, you know here in California um, you know heavy manufacturing is is um, a lot less than it than it was you know 15 20 years ago here in the state we see a lot of um, healthcare oriented companies with these kinds of metrics um, so you know those are in general um, and then it does get back to the the management teams um, you know technology companies of course we, we do have technology companies in our portfolio and they're generally higher paying jobs it's uh, generally a hundred percent health care coverage and um, you you see a lot of um, employee participation in, in options and and equity in those businesses so it, it does depend a little bit on sector and industry um, and certainly management teams um, you know, if we walk into a business and they're kind of staring at us with a blank face uh, when we, we talk about some of the mission goals that we have, you know, they're, they're, they may not likely be the kind of business anyway that, that is going to be successful from an economic standpoint, uh, from our opinion as well. Great. Um, this is Andrea again. Um, want to pick up, yeah, on a couple of uh, uh, of themes that, uh, that that came through in the comments. One is, yeah, this uh, opportunity to really form a coalition. It's still really a fairly small world of um, uh, of fund managers that are being particularly thoughtful around. Uh, uh, around these issues, and I think that um, for for this to become more of a broadly uh, accepted uh, and adopted uh, initiative, we uh, we really welcome uh, everybody who works in this area to to join up with us. And the other point uh, that um, that came up is around this uh, stream streamlining the the standards, building on what exists already, and not just uh, replicating or um, you know, creating confusion in the in the marketplace, so to speak, around what uh, what standards are are available, and that's definitely something that we are uh, working on right now. Um, and even on that, we would welcome all sorts of uh, insights from the folks that have been uh, working on this for for a long time to to see what's out there, which standards are actually being used by the fund managers, which standards are being reported out whose voices have not been included again an important going back to the to the principles you know a very important uh, um part of the work that we do at, at transform finance you know which uh, how can we include the um, the workers um and worker representative voices in coming up with standards not just have it be a, a one way investor effort and then coordinating that with uh, with the existing work that's out there, including in particular what uh, what the folks at B Labs, uh, B Analytics have done uh, with uh, uh, with gears to to come up with one um, coherent and uh, and consistent set for for everybody to adopt. And here I have put my my information again, Andrea at transformfinance.org. Uh, I'd be delighted to share more around the around the project uh, um, and uh, and get all sorts of, uh, of feedback from the from the folks on the on the call. Um, is there anything else from uh, from you guys, uh, Anair, Hope, or Tim? No, I, I just say uh, thank you very much, Andrea, for putting it together. We're happy to participate. And, um, if there's any questions that come out of this, we're, we're available as well. Great. 
And then I will uh, I will make a note for the for the members of the Transform Finance Investor Network and for others who uh, might be interested in uh, in joining the network or joining the webinar. Uh, we'll have uh, the next webinar on uh, July 22nd on a very related issue of how you can tie a fund manager's return to the to the impact that they are creating. This will be on July 22nd at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll be showcasing the work of the Media Development Investment Fund um, that uh, invests in, uh, in media companies, and they have come up with a, uh, with a pretty interesting structure um, uh, for their upcoming um, equity fund, uh, where their carry will be will be tied. A hundred percent to their performance on the on the impact side. So, uh, if you're interested in uh, in an invite for that, feel free to shoot me a note as well. And unless there is anything else, I would love to thank you all for the great work that you're doing, and in particular, thanks to Team and Hope, uh, uh, Anair at Pi, as well as uh, as Morgan at Pi for taking the charge with this and really putting forth for us a, a, a tremendous example of what can be done by by collaborating with uh, with asset owners and with uh, and with fund managers to to create good and over time better jobs um, so thank you all for for participating um, yeah and uh, please be in touch around this initiative All right, on air.